everyone. Welcome to the MIFA presentation. Um, my name is Sheila Knesting, Associate Director of Financial Aid at UMass Amherst. I've been doing financial aid for over 30 years, so I have a little bit of experience. I've put two children through college. Uh, my son has graduated. My daughter is in her fifth year. She's in a five-year physician assistant program. Um, they both played athletics, so I'm also familiar with athletic financial aid for Division I athletes and Division III athletes. So that's something else to be concerned about if you're thinking about college athletics. Um, this presentation, like she said, will last about an hour and a half. Um, if you've got questions, if you could hold your questions until the end, we certainly will have a Q&A session. And then if you have questions that you'd like to ask privately, I'll stick around so that you can ask those questions. This presentation is kind of geared towards seniors, but if you're juniors or sophomores in the audience, um, it certainly is a good thing to get a head start on the presentations. These slides can be found online on the MEPA website, so if you want to, I see a lot of you though, have it printed out, so thank you for printing it out for them. So a little bit about MEPA. MEPA is a not-for-profit state authority that was created in 1982. I remember when it was created, that's really sad. Um, it helps families plan, pay, and save for college. And they've got some really good information that they can provide you with, so you want to certainly go out on MIFA.org for information, tools, and resources. Tonight you can sign up for their emails. They're also on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. They have really helpful webinars. So if some of you are thinking about applying for colleges that require the profile form, they have a really helpful webinar on how to complete the, the profile form. And then you can sign up for yourplanforthefuture.org. It's another website that has lots of really good information. So they do provide a variety of webinars throughout the academic year on really helpful topics that will help you get through this process. And so you can do this. I know a lot of families come into this financial aid process and they're overwhelmed and they think, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? But I guarantee you, you're going to walk out of here tonight and feel empowered that you can do this. And if you can't, you've got this presentation that you can go back and ask questions to. You've got MIFA that you can dial in and ask questions to, and any of the colleges that you're interested in, I'm sure those financial aid offices are very ready to answer your questions. So let's talk about our agenda. We've got the types and sources of financial aid, the application process, how financial decisions are made, paying for college, and then free resources. So let's talk first about the types <clears throat> and sources of financial aid. So what is financial aid? Financial aid is money that is available to help students pay for college. And that help comes in the source of three main types of financial aid. So the grants and, grants and scholarships, which are the free financial aid, the best kind of financial aid, you're never going to decline a grant or a scholarship. And then there's work study, and then there's student loans. Work study, is a campus job. And you'll understand in a little bit how work study helps pay for those indirect expenses that colleges factor into a student's cost. Um, work study typically cannot be used to pay the bill. So uh, work study typically, if students are eligible for federal work study, for example at UMass Amherst, an incoming student will receive $1,500 in a federal work study award upper class students will receive $1,800 in a federal work study award. And that is spread out over the academic year to help pay for those indirect expenses that are factored into the student's cost. The benefit to the student is in the following year when they're applying for financial aid, any income that they earn through the federal work study program is considered financial aid and doesn't get factored into their financial aid expected family contribution. The benefit to the employers on campus is they're only paying a very small percentage of the student's wages. 
So federal work study students are more attractive to employers on campus to hire because they can hire more of them for the same amount of money. Um, federal student loans are considered financial aid because there are special repayment terms. As well, there are options for college students to borrow a loan without a co-signer, so they can borrow student loans in their own name. Um, student loans, as a reminder, must be repaid, and you don't have to accept the loan or the work study. It is optional. So merit-based financial aid. Let's talk first about merit-based financial aid. So merit-based financial aid is awarded in recognition of some sort of achievement, whether it be academic, artistic, athletic. Applicants are usually compared against one another, and it may or it may not be renewable, and it's not offered at every school. So you want to make sure, if you're selecting a college based on a merit scholarship, that you really understand the rules and regs surrounding that scholarship. Um, some of them have a GPA, that um, average that they need to maintain to keep that scholarship. And then ask questions. And I always like to say this, my son received a freshman merit scholarship at his college. Well, if you think about the name of it, you would think that's only available for the first year because it was a freshman merit scholarship. Well, that was the name of the scholarship and he was eligible for it for all four years. So make sure that you ask a lot of questions. Um, most merit-based financial aid does come from the institution. However, one example would be the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship. This is based on MCAS scores, and it is renewable for eight semesters of eligibility, and students need to maintain a 3.0 GPA. They also make sh need to make sure that they fill out the FAFSA form in order to be eligible for that. So now let's talk about need-based financial aid. So need-based financial aid is based on the family's financial eligibility, their need. And the eligibility is determined by a standard formula. For example, for most federal financial aid, we're using federal methodology. That's the name of the methodology that we use to calculate eligibility. And it includes grants, loans, and work study. Most financial aid is need-based. And you need to be making satisfactory academic progress in order to um, maintain eligibility for financial aid. And so satisfactory academic progress, let me just give you um, a sense of what that means. So for example, at UMass Amherst, after four semesters, students have to have a 2.0 GPA. And then students must graduate within 10 semesters. That's the, the registrar's rule that students have to graduate within 10 semesters. So those are the general terms for students to be making satisfactory academic progress. So if they're not making satisfactory academic progress, the first time they're placed on warning, so they continue to be eligible for financial aid. But if they continue after that warning semester of not maintaining eligibility, then they're no longer eligible for financial aid unless they have some circumstances that they can appeal. For example, if there was some medical issue. But if they're simply, um, well, I had some trouble adjusting to college and that's why my GPA is not a 2.0 after four semesters, that wouldn't be considered an extenuating circumstance and that student may lose eligibility for financial aid. So let's talk about the sources of financial aid. Where does financial aid come from? It comes from the federal government, Pell Grants, Work Study, uh, William D. Ford Federal Direct Student Loans, there are tax incentives, Massachusetts, the Massachusetts um, Mass Grant State Scholarship, there's tuition waivers. So let's talk a little bit more about tuition waivers. We already talked about the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship. Well, that's really a tuition waiver. So the value of tuition at UMass Amherst is $1,714. So you can't stack those tuition waivers. So if you're, you have a parent who's an employee at UMass Amherst and you're eligible for the John and Abigail Adams scholarship, you would have to choose one of those scholarships. You wouldn't be able to stack them and have more than one uh, tuition waiver. Uh, colleges and universities, financial aid comes from the institution. For example, at UMass, a UMass Amherst grant. Students who park on campus and get a traffic fines 
uh, traffic fines. There is a traffic fine scholarship, parking fine scholarship that students. And then there's other, other scholarships. All students right now should be doing scholarship searches. And this is your chance to talk about the scholarships that you offer at Frontier Regional. So um, all scholarships that we um, know about So all of the scholarships that we have information on, we post on the scholarship update on the Frontier webpage under the Guidance tab. That scholarship update is put out monthly. Um, for instance, up on the website right now is the November update. During the early part of the year, uh, fall semester primarily, there are national and regional scholarships. So for instance, um, one of the ones on here is the Coca-Cola Scholarship. That's a national scholarship. That information is sent to every high school in the country. Um, we also have more of a regional scholarship listed on the update. For instance, the Big Y Scholarship. So that doesn't go out to Indiana and to California, but it is sent to all of the high schools in the region. So right now, early part of the year, national, and then we get into more regional scholarships. Later on in spring semester, the local organizations will put out their scholarship information. Some of them will have their own application. For instance, Yankee Candle has their own application that we will put out. Some of the organizations don't want to do the kind of paperwork where they put out their own application, but they use what we call the Frontier Financial Aid Form. And so students are able to fill out one form that can be given to multiple organizations based on their criteria. For instance, someone may say, um, I want to sponsor a scholarship for education majors or nursing majors. And so to, if a student has filled out the Frontier form and indicated nursing as their intended major, and that's what the organization wants, we will send all the applicants who have indicated a nursing major to that particular organization and sponsor. But everything that we have is put on these updates and it's available on the web. The reason we put it on the web is the national and regional organizations have applications online. And so these are hyperlinks right to the organization's online application. Later in the spring with the local organizations, that will tend to be more paper applications. And so it will say application available in the guidance office. And students can come in at any time and the file is in alphabetical order by name of the organization accessible to students um, as they're walking in between classes. There is also information um, out there online through national um, websites like FastWeb. We have given all juniors um, when they were all when they were juniors, and then again seniors at the beginning of senior year, the names of reputable scholarship websites. You never want to pay for a scholarship search. If you are being asked to give money to get a list of scholarships online, don't do it. Um, the reputable organizations do not charge for listing scholarships. And so if I can answer any questions after the presentation um, to provide more specific information, don't hesitate to ask. You can also always call your student's guidance counselor um, if you have questions as you go down the line. All right, thank you. I want to make sure, I have lots of notes on every slide, so I want to make sure that I'm giving you all the information. Okay, so here's the breakdown of where financial aid funds come from. And um, obviously, the big important piece on this slide is how much money is available. $184.5 billion is available in financial aid funds. So that was in the year two, the financial aid academic year 2013-2014.
So you can see that a good percentage of financial aid is made up of student loans, but there's also a lot of federal grants, institutional grants, tax credits, private grants, state grants, and work study. I, I'm still shocked that work study is less than 1%. We have about um, at least 30 students that work in the financial aid office alongside of us, and we would not be able to get our job done without those students. Uh, we certainly rely on our work study students to help us out in the office. So now let's talk about the application process. So what I like to say to families, and I found it to be extremely helpful, when we started the process for financial aid for both of our children, we created a folder for every school that they were interested in applying for and put information in those folders anytime you'll be amazed at how much information you will accumulate, whether it's the, the admissions application, the financial aid application, your tax information, scholarship information. Every school is going to have their own process. All schools are going to require that you complete the free application for federal student aid. It is available starting in January 2016. Okay, but um, you right now you can go out and log on and get your FSA ID. Okay, so you can do that on fsaid.ed.gov. Okay, so both the parent and the student needs to have an FSA ID. That essentially is your electronic signature. It's a name and a password, a username and a password. Um, the, the data retrieval tool will be available on February 1st. And so on your tax, on your FAFSA form, it's going to ask you for a lot of income information. And so you can, you can estimate your income information. It's more important that you make sure that you fill out that financial aid application by the school's deadline. Every school will have their own deadline. At UMass Amherst, it's March 1st. Some of those deadlines will be very similar. March 1st, February 15th, February 1st. So what you want to be doing right now is making sure that you understand what the application deadline is to apply for financial aid and what the application process is. So what's on that FAFSA? The colleges that you're applying for, the parent and the student data. So parents, if you are married, and this includes same-sex couples who are married, you must include both parents. All parents that live together, whether they're married or not, need to fill out the FAFSA form. If you are a divorced or separated parent, it's only the custodial parent's information that gets completed on the FAFSA form. So you have to decide if the student lives with both parents jointly, then who provided the most support? That is the student. That is the parent that fills out that FAFSA form. And then for 2016-17, you're going to be using your 2015 tax return. Your assets, there'll be a section for assets. Now this applies to both the student and the parent. There are two sections. So assets, that includes your savings, your checking, your investment property. Do not include your home. Your primary home is not included. The value of your retirement is not included. Your life insurance is not included. And if you are a small business owner, the value of your business is not included. So what I always like to say to families is when you're answering the question about your cash assets, your cash and savings and checking account, you want to fill out that FAFSA after you've paid your monthly bills. Okay, because it's as of the date that you're filing the FAFSA. That's what they're going to ask you. So pay your bills and then answer the question about how much is in your, cat, in your um, assets. And then they're going to ask you how many are in your household and how many are in college. So you're going to include the high school senior and any older siblings that are in college. And if they're in graduate school and they're living at home and you're providing at least half their support, you can include them. So other applications. The other application would be the profile form. So those are usually completed for schools that have large endowments, Mount Holyoke, Amherst, Bowdoin, 
those kinds of schools, Stoneville. Those are the schools that are asking you to complete a profile form. There's a $25 charge for the first school and then $16 for each additional school. And you're filling that application out on student.collegeboard.org slash profile form. Did I just lose my presentation? I did. <laughs> so with the profile form, the non-custodial parent also needs to fill out information. And MIFA has a really good recording so if you want to go out there and look at the webinar on how to complete the profile form, it's available for, from MIFA. And then, and then schools can also require that you complete an institutional application. So you're always going to have a FAFSA form. You may have a profile form. And there could be an institutional application. So you want to make sure that your information is consistent across all three of those applications. And if they ask you the question, how much can you contribute towards your son or daughter's education? Don't put zero, and don't put something that is not attainable for you to contribute. Because if they go through and do the calculations, but you're offering $2,000 more than what the calculation says, they may take that, that offer that you're, you're suggesting that, they, that you can pay. So make sure that it's something that you reasonably contribute. So what you want to be figuring out right now is you want to get your FSA ID for both the parent and the student, and you want to go on to every single college that you have an interest in applying for admission and find out when their financial aid deadline is and what their application requirements are. And some of those schools, like for example, I'm going to give you a little personal story here. My daughter applied to St. Lawrence. And so when we were applying, when she applied for admission to St. Lawrence, she checked the box, no, we're not applying for financial aid. And then I went in behind her and completed the financial aid application. And the school contacted me and said, but you said in your admission application that you were not applying for financial aid. So make sure that, and it, was, it wasn't a big deal, but your application might go in two different directions if you're applying for financial aid and if you're not applying for financial aid. So there may be a question on the, the admissions application regarding your application status for financial aid. I suggest you always say that you're applying for financial aid. So after you apply for financial aid, so the colleges, so uh, you're going to fill out that FAFSA form and there is a place for up to 10 schools for you to list you, the schools that you want your application information to electronically be sent to. So every school has their own code, and you can look up the codes when you're filling out the application. It's very simple. Um, then you will receive, when you, after you apply for financial aid, you will receive a student aid report. You'll receive it electronically at whatever email. The other thing that I would suggest that you do is set up a Gmail email account because you want to be able to get into these emails and if you're using your son or daughter's email, they may not be good about consistently looking at those emails and that's the, that's the way all of the information is going to come. So what we did was we set up a, a separate Gmail account so that any time we were sending in application information to the colleges, we would list that Gmail account. That way, the parents can also have access to the emails that are coming in. It's really helpful. And that's where your student aid report is going to go, to an email account. And so you want to make sure when you get that student aid report that you review the information because basically what that student aid report is going to do is it's going to list all the information that you put down on your FAFSA form. And it's going to give you a chance to correct it. And you want to make sure that your, your information is as accurate as possible because that's how the school is going to calculate your eligibility for financial aid based on that FAFSA information. So if it's incorrect, then your financial aid award potentially could be incorrect. Um, you want to contact the college with any special circumstances. For example, you're filling out that FAFSA form with 2015's tax information, but perhaps in 2016, someone became unemployed or maybe there was a death in the family. So if there are some special circumstances, 
you want to get in touch with the school and let them know. Some schools will revise that financial aid award prior to candidate reply date. Other schools may not, but you want to get in touch with the school and let them know that you have some special circumstances. Some schools, um, some families will be selected for verification. And so verification essentially is an audit of the information that you put down in your financial aid application with your tax information and then other forms that verify your household size and the number in college. So remember we talked about the IRS data retrieval tool. So if you've done the data retrieval tool, then you've satisfied your requirement for your federal tax return. If you are not eligible to file, do the IRS data retrieval tool, or you choose not to, then, and you're selected for verification, you will have to submit an IRS tax return transcript to the college. Now, the tax return transcript is different than your federal tax return. Um, I'd say we're in probably the third year that we've been required to use the federal tax return transcript. I think what happened was the, the federal government um, perceived that there were too many forged tax returns that were coming into the financial aid office and the, the tax return transcript comes directly from the federal government. So um, that's why we are required to use the tax return transcript. So if you have more than 10 schools, so there's room on the FAFSA for 10 schools to receive your information electronically. So if you're applying to more than 10 schools, the way that you get those other schools onto that FAFSA to get your information electronically is first you want to contact the schools to make sure that they've downloaded your application from the federal government. So if they've downloaded your application information after you've made any corrections that you need to, then you can change out one of the first 10 schools that you've listed on the FAFSA form. But you want to call the potential schools that you're changing out to make sure that they've received your FAFSA form before you change them. So how are financial aid decisions made? We're using a formula. And here's the formula. And there's all kinds of EFC calculators out there. So if you want to go out in a minute, I'll sh um, and calculate your expected family contribution, there's very good sites that you can go to. So what we're doing in the financial aid offices is looking at cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution equals the student's need for financial aid. So everyone should fill out the FAFSA form. There is something for everyone, even if you don't have need using this formula. You'll see that in a minute. So what's in that cost of attendance? So the financial aid cost of attendance is going to be different than potentially what's on the admissions website for the cost of attendance. The admissions website typically may have the tuition and fees and room and board, but the financial aid cost of attendance is going to be a living budget. What does it truly cost that student to be a student for nine months? So it is going to include some indirect costs. So there's going to be tuition and fees, room and board, books, travel, personal expenses. So at UMass Amherst, we've got the tuition and fees. We put in $1,000 for books. We assume that students are going to spend $500 each semester on books. There will be periods of time that students have to leave the campus. We're a state school, so we factor in $400 for travel. And then there will be items that students have to buy. For example, if you're a student coming to UMass from California, you're going to need winter clothes. So there's $1,000 in our cost of attendance for personal expenses. <clears throat> so we're looking at a living budget. What does it truly cost that student to be a student for nine months on the campus? So there's those direct expenses, and then there's the indirect expenses. So the expected family contribution, that's the calculated amount that a family has the ability to, ability to absorb for one year of college ex expenses. It is not what you owe the university. It is simply a tool that we use in the financial aid office using a federal formula to calculate eligibility for financial aid. And every federal formula is the same. We're using it for all families. 
And it's based on the thought that families have the primary responsibility for paying for college. And as best as they can, after that, financial aid becomes available. But the expected family contribution is not essentially what the family will pay. And here are some good ESC calculators. Bigfuture.collegeboard.org and FAFSA Forecaster on FAFSA.gov. So the FAFSA Forecaster, so if you wanted to go out right now and put in your information and pre-fill out your FAFSA form, you can do it using FAFSA Forecaster. And then after January 1st, 2016, you can upload your information from FAFSA Forecaster onto your FAFSA form. So all your demographic information will be available for you to upload. And you'll get a sense of what your expected family contribution will be. And you can do that right now. All schools are required to have a net price calculator on their website. It's an online tool. It's going to ask questions about your family's finances and students' academics, and it will provide you with a personal estimated net college price. Okay. So now we're going to talk about <clears throat> how assets are impacted on that expected family contribution. So our example here is a family of four with one in college. So as you can see, family A, B, and C all have the same income, $75,000. But family A has no assets, family B has $75,000 in assets, and family C has $150,000 in assets. And you can see what the difference is in their expected family contribution. So even that family C that has $150,000 of assets, their expected family contribution is still not through the stratosphere for having $150,000 in assets. And this slide is, is here to help illustrate that saving for college is not a bad thing. If you save for college, you still may have eligibility for financial aid. But let's look at income. So we have three families here, family A, B, and C, family A earns 75,000, family B earns 100,000, and family C earns 150,000. They all have $50,000 in assets. But look at the difference that income plays in that expected family contribution from family A with that $75,000 income to family C with the, the $150,000 income. Income plays a much larger role in calculating that expected family contribution. So let's talk some more about how the formula works. So that expected family contribution is going to stay the same no matter what the cost of attendance is. So you see that college D that doesn't cost very much. That expected family contribution is meeting the cost of the college. So there is no financial aid eligibility for need-based aid. College C, there is some eligibility. College, so we get all the way up to College A that costs $60,000. That family has a lot of eligibility for financial aid. And so this slide is helping to illustrate that the expected family contribution stays the same no matter what the cost is. So I'm gonna just fill up the barrel. So here we have a barrel, and obviously the very first thing that goes into the barrel is the expected family contribution, because we've already talked about the fact that families have the primary responsibility for paying for college. So that $5,000 expected family contribution goes into the barrel first. Next, scholarships. We already talked about how grants and scholarships are the best kind of financial aid. It doesn't have to be repaid. So the $9,500 scholarship and the $13,500 grant is in the barrel next. And then goes in the student loans. Okay. So the student loans, that's the maximum loan. The $5,500 is the maximum loan that a freshman is eligible for through the federal student loan program. And then there's work study. 
That $3,500 work study, that's a pretty big work study award. That student is expected to work pretty hard while they're in college. And then there's unmet need. So unmet need is need that the student has that the institution is not funding. So basically, you take your expected family contribution and add on the unmet need, and that's what the family is paying for that college. Okay. So now let's talk about award letters. So MIFA has a really good after, what is it called, after the financial aid award, and uh, it's, it's a financial aid, it's a session to help families make a decision about what college is the best college for them to go to. And I think locally it's at Amherst Regional High School. And if you sign up for those MIFA emails, they'll send you information. You go into those, those uh, MIFA after the financial aid award with your award letters in hand and your son or daughter with you, and they will help you really break it down to figure out what schools are offering you and how much it's gonna cost you. So we have uh, award letters here, college A, B, and C, and with the cost is $40,000, the EFC is $5,000, so the total eligibility is $35,000. And you can see the difference in the financial aid awards. Um, grants and scholarships is basically what's the difference. College A, B, and C are offering different amounts of grant money. College A is offering $26,000, so there is no unmet need. College B is offering $23,000, so there's $3,000 of unmet need, and College C is only offering $18,000. So the unmet need is $8,000. They're all offering students the maximum student loans and $3,500 in work study. Now remember, work study cannot be used to pay the bill. Work study is there to help students pay for those indirect expenses that have been factored into that financial aid cost of attendance. It gives them, so for example, at UMass Hammer, students get paid bi-weekly and it helps them pay for their movie tickets, their meals out, their laundry, uh, the winter clothing if they need them. So the work study is, help, is helping students fund their indirect expenses. Maybe it's helping to pay for their books, but it is not something that is helping them pay their bill directly. It's not a credit against the bill when the bill comes to you. Okay. So now we have, in here, we have College A, B, and C again. And so College A is giving $23,000 in grant money. Maybe they're a really talented student and they're offering that student a merit scholarship for $23,000. College B is giving that student $13,000 in grant money. And College C gave them no grant money at all. Perhaps they were a late applicant for financial aid. They applied after their deadline. So they're not eligible for any grant money. Once again, they have the maximum student loans that students are eligible for. But in this case, you see College B and College C is offering a parent loan. Now that parent loan that included in this financial aid award is a credit-based loan that parents have to apply for and be approved for their credit. So you want to really think carefully about whether or not um, that's something that you want to do. And then College A and B, once again, is offering work study. Perhaps College C, once again, the student was a late applicant for financial aid, so isn't eligible for any kind of, anything except the student loans. So you can see that the totals are all the same, but of $32,000 in financial aid, but how they arrived at that $32,000 is different at A, B, and C. So, now we're gonna talk about um, paying for college. So, when you're paying for college, you wanna think about the past, the present, and the future. So the past, if you've got any kind of college savings, how do you wanna use them? If you've got a 529 account, if you've got money set aside, if grandparents have 529 accounts uh, in the student's name, how are you gonna use that, that college savings? And you don't have to dip into it the first year, for example, if the stock market is really good right now, you may not want to dip into your 529 account. You might want to let it grow. So you really have to make decisions about the past, how you want to use that college savings, the present. Are you going to accept the financial aid awards that have been offered? Yes, you're going to accept the grants and scholarships. Do you want the loans? Do you want the work study? 
So are you going to accept the financial aid award that has been offered to the student? Um, are you going to use a payment plan? Most schools will have a, ten, a payment plan. For example, at UMass Amherst, we have a 10-month payment plan. For a small enrollment fee, five payments go to the fall semester, five payments go to the spring semester. You decide how much you want to enroll in that payment plan. And then how much are you willing to pay when that bill comes to you? The bill will come probably twice a year. At uh, UMass, it's in July, and it's again in December. So how much are you willing to pay out of your checking account when that bill comes to you? So after you've thought about the past and the present, then you want to think about the future, which potentially is loans, credit-based alternative loans, MIFA loans, parent loans, PLUS loans, parent loans for undergraduate students, that's the federal loan program. So you can use a combination of all of these to put together a financing plan. And then you want to be thinking about the fact that you're doing this for at least four years, maybe five. Are there other siblings that are in college? And then think about, I always like to include this for families because it may not be something that you're necessarily thinking about, is where is that school that your son or daughter is going to? So if it's a school that's far away and you have to get on an airplane, and get there by plane, or even if it's a long drive, calculate the cost that it's going to be for you to get to there. And then think about the fact that you're going to have to get them in September. They may want to come home for Thanksgiving. They're going to have to come home at the end of the fall semester. They're going to have to go back for spring semester. They're going to have to leave for spring break. They're going to have to get back from spring break. And then they're going to come home in May, and then add on one trip just for emergencies. So you've got eight trips. So figure out what that's going to cost for one trip, times it by however many trips, and add that on to the cost of attendance, because that's a cost that you're going to have. So let's talk about those student loans, those $5,500 student loans that we had factored into those financial aid awards. So the student is the borrower. There is no credit check. There can be a subsidized loan. Subsidized means that the federal government is paying the interest while the student is enrolled in school and during a six-month grace period after graduation. An unsubsidized loan, the student is starting the payment on the interest as soon as that loan is dispersed or they're postponing that payment until after graduation through um, a process called capitalization. But every year the loan is growing by the amount of the um, interest payment that the student is not making. There are annual limits. <clears throat> Freshmen are eligible for $5,500. $3,500 of that is a subsidized loan. Sophomores are eligible for $6,500. $4,500 of that is a subsidized loan. And then juniors and seniors are eligible for 7,500, and 5,500 of that is the subsidized loan. So the interest rate for the subsidized loans is 4.29%. Um, and then they have a repayment calculator here for you to see. So if a student borrowed <clears throat> approximately $300 a month for 10, pay for 10 years for $27,000 of debt, <clears throat> so students really have to be thinking about their debt as along with um, where they're going to college. So free resources. So um, at Amherst Regional, again, myself and Kate Gentile, who's the Associate Director at Amherst College, we sponsor a FAFSA, it's a FAFSA night. Um, I think it's January 29th, I do believe. It's the last Thursday in January. And so what this FAFSA night is, we get all of our colleagues from Smith, Mount Holyoke, Amherst, Hampshire, and UMass. And there's a whole group of us from all the different colleges, and we have a presentation, and we go line by line through the FAFSA form, and there are enough people, so if everybody in the room probably raised their hand, there's probably 10 or 15 financial aid professionals there that night helping to fill out that FAFSA form. So you want to think about coming to FAFSA Day, but you do have to register because the room does fill up. FAFSAday.org is where you do that. 
and then there's those educational opportunity centers that you can get help, and then the IRS, the free tax preparation centers, you can go to irs.gov if you need help filling out your FAFSA form or your tax return. So paying the college bill seminars, that's what I was talking about a few minutes ago, that after you've got your financial aid award, uh, you can go to these paying the college bill seminars and they will go through your financial aid award letters and help you really figure out how much it is going to cost you uh, to go to those colleges. And you do have to register for that, and you can register for those sessions through MIFA. So what you can do right now. So we know we have to do our research on scholarships. We know that we have to fill out our FSA ID. You want to make sure that you've gone on to the uh, financial aid websites for all of the colleges that your son or daughter is remotely interested in and make sure that you're understanding the financial aid application process, the forms, the deadlines, because if you saw through that one slide potentially what happens if a student is a late applicant for financial aid. You want to sign up for the um, MIFA emails. You can go online and do the FAFSA forecaster. And you can certainly look at those net price calculators that are on each and every one of the, the websites for the schools. It is a, a regulation. The schools are required to have those net price calculators available. And you can certainly do those EFC calculators. So if you want to fool around with your information and what if, my, what if, what if there's going to be two in college? What does that do to my expected family contribution? What if there's three in college? Well, what if our taxes paid is uh, Three thousand dollars, or one of our U.S. taxes paid is eight thousand dollars. You'll be amazed to see what a difference the expected family contribution is just based on U.S. tax paid. And now is your chance to ask questions. So if you've got some questions, I'd be more than happy to answer your questions for you. Yeah. able to contribute very little, if any, money. So in order to qualify for financial aid, you have to fill out these forms. And it's based on your expected family contribution, what you're going to get for financial aid. But if you've got some sort of special circumstances, you would want to get in touch with each, each school. But remember, the primary responsibility for paying for college rests with the family. And so if, if financial aid was based on um, will or will not versus can or cannot, we'd have a whole new calculation for determining eligibility based on will or will not. And I'm sure that more families would stand in that will not line than the will line. So we have to base it based on can or cannot and the information that's on that FAFSA form. But if you've got some sort of special circumstances, then you need to get in touch directly with the schools. No? So the EFC is calculated. Let me see if I can get back to that slide. So there are four parts to the expected family contribution. Parent contribution from income, parent contribution from assets, student contribution from income, and student contribution from assets. Those four combine to be known as the expected family contribution. And it is based on a federal formula how that gets determined, that expected family contribution. And every single college college uses that same formula. So the government figures Yes. Figure. The government determines what the formula is that the schools use to award financial aid because a good percentage is coming from the federal government. So they have a hand in putting together that formula for determining the expected family contribution. More questions? questions? What is the difference between an asset and an income? And I think we had a slide that talked about what your assets were. 
So your assets, they include your savings, your checking, your investments, other property. Your income is what you get paid to do your job. Your, whether you get paid weekly, bi-weekly, it's from working typically, or you have a business and it's from your business income. But this is what, the, what your assets are, okay? Yeah? If you have a grandparent that has a 529 plan for, say, my son, how does that get filled out in the past? So the, question, their so the question is, if you have a grandparent that has a 529 account, how does that get factored in? So the, the, the grandparent owns the asset. So it is the, the asset is with the owner, but any contribution that they give to the student is considered untaxed income and has to be reported on the FAFSA. Yes? So I understand that you can have Not for parents, it's part of the parent's savings. He was asking specifically about a grandparent contributing to this, to their grandson's education. But if you have a 529 account of your own set aside for saving for college, you want to get in touch with the Fidelity or whoever is, who has that 529 account. And then you want to get in touch with the, the billing office at the school and ask them, how do I get that money to you? But you, as the owner of that asset, get to decide how you want to use it. Do you want to put it, set it aside and use it all in your senior year? Do you want to use it across four years evenly? You, as the owner of the asset, get to decide how you want to use that 529 account to pay for college. Okay? More questions? Yeah. Is your information sent in if you use that FAFSA forecaster? It's out there, but it's just that's a forecaster. It's not your FAFSA form. And you can go on to any or all of those ESC tools and put your information in and change it up. And same thing with net price calculators, change up the information. That's the whole idea of it so that you can get some sense ahead of time of what your expected family contribution is going to be or how much it's going to cost you. More questions? I had a parent call me once um, and ask a very specific question, and I, I didn't know the answer to it. So the two things that I told them to do were that they could call financial aid professionals and pose the question at schools that they were interested in, or they could call MIFA and perhaps get some information. But the question that I remember had specifically to do with retirement. And the question was, is it only the official, you know, account, like is it they have to the company or if they have supplementary things like 503 fees and all of that? I mean, what counts, what can they actually consider their retirement money that doesn't get included in assets? Because, like I said, I didn't know the answer to the question. Well, colleges, there's, there's a question on the, there's a section on the W-2 form that is about retirement, and it's that box. Okay. It's, there, there is a specific box, and I don't know what the box number is off the top of my head, but that's for retirement, if you have like a 403B account. Um, but the contribution that families make towards their retirement that year is considered untaxed income on the FAFSA form. So if you contribute, for example, when you're filling out your 2015 tax return, if you have $5,000 that you're contributing into your retirement account, that is considered untaxed income, but you do not have to report the value of your retirement account, but the contribution for this year would be counted as untaxed income. Okay. 
So I have a question, and I'm going to follow it up with an answer for you. How are outside scholarships treated? And first of all, what is an outside scholarship? So an outside scholarship are all of those scholarships that she was talking about earlier that the Frontier Regional offers. An outside scholarship essentially is any scholarship that is awarded by someone other than the financial aid office. And so the question that you want to be asking schools is, how do you treat outside scholarships? So remember that slide with the, <clears throat> where is it? Okay, so here's the slide with the barrel. So how do colleges treat that outside scholarship? So this, this student has, um, so their cost of attendance is $40,000. They have a $5,000 expected family contribution. So their eligibility for financial aid is $35,000. So their financial aid from all sources cannot exceed that $35,000. So how are the outside scholarships treated by colleges? Some colleges first will let those outside scholarships fill in that need. So the first $3,000 of outside scholarships at some colleges would go towards filling the unmet need. Other colleges might replace some of that grant money, that 13-5 in grant money that they awarded them, the institutional grant money with the outside scholarship. So if that student, for example, got $6,000 in outside scholarships, perhaps the first $3,000 would go towards filling the unmet need, and maybe they would reduce down that student loan by the other 3,000, so they would have less loan or maybe it would reduce down their work study first. So you want to ask the colleges, how do you treat outside scholarships? And if they say, well, a scholarship that you get replaces the scholarship that we've given, that's important to know. If it first fills on that need, you want to know that. If it's going to reduce down work study or student loan, the self-help portion of the financial aid award, that's important to know too. And every school can make their own decision on how they treat outside scholarships. Most schools will have unmet need, and but you don't want that need being met with a parent loan. So, in college, here we are with this college that's um, they're all getting to the same amount of unmet need, but one of those colleges is putting in a parent loan. So, what is the composition of the financial aid awards? And if they're if if they're the same on that need, but one of the colleges is giving the students five thousand dollars of work study, that work study, once again, is not something that's helping to pay the bill. It's helping to pay the indirect expenses. So essentially, that's something that the family is paying out of pocket as well. So the work study plus the unmet need um, and the expected family contribution is essentially the responsibility of the family towards paying that college cost. The work study will help pay the indirect expenses, though, that the student has a job on campus, and the work study will help next year to reduce down the expected family contribution, the student from income component of that expected family contribution. because there are income, there are interest rate considerations, and you have a grace period after graduation. It just seems like in the news that the interest rates are high, so I don't understand why they're benefits. They are benefits, yeah. My second question is, what's the difference between a work study and just having to pick you up your job? Is it still money for it? So the difference between a work study job and a non-work study job, so students don't have to have work study necessarily to work on a college campus. There, the jobs will be posted for, for example, at UMass we have work-study jobs and non-work-study jobs. And the work-study jobs, remember, there's incentives for the employers on campus. They're only paying a small percentage of the students' wages. Most of them, most of it's being paid out of the federal work-study funds. And the incentive to the student is it helps reduce down their 
contribution from their income for that expected family contribution. Yeah. Okay. More questions? So the question is, if the student has income, does that get calculated on the FAFSA? Yes. Four parts of that expected family contribution. Student contribution from income, so if they have a job and they're working, it's going to get calculated towards that expected family contribution. Absolutely. It's one of the four parts of the calculation. Are in the they're either they're the asset of the owner, or the parent, or it can be the asset of someone else. They're not in the student's name. Five to nine accounts are not in the student's names. Are they listed on them? They, yeah, because they're a, they're a beneficiary of them, but um, it won't get calculated at the student's rate of of the expected family contribution for students. Okay. It gets calculated at the parents' rate, which is a lot less than the students. Yeah? Is the entire amount of the 529 factored into the formula, or is it a percentage? It's just listed as the asset. It's a percentage. It goes through the, the, uh, the assets. It's the asset of the parents, and the assets are calculated at a very reduced rate. But if it's the asset of the grandparent, then it all counts as untaxed income on the FAFSA form. Yeah. If the student has a job now in high school, that has to go on to the FAFSA form. But if it's a job that they won't have on their way to college, it still affects the amount of loans they can get. Okay. I think there's a slide here that talks about. This is the number three, contact the financial aid office with any special circumstance. So if you have a son or daughter who has a job and they're working 20, 25 hours a week and then they're gonna go off to college and their income is going to be, maybe they're not gonna work at all, then that would be a, an appeal. You would wanna ask the, the college to take a second look at the student's eligibility for financial aid based on the fact that in 2016, they will no longer be working. More questions? <laughs> Go ahead. Is it advisable to try to keep a little cash in your bank account? Well, you want to make sure that you pay your expenses before. The question on the FAFSA is going to ask you what the value of your assets are at the day that you're completing the FAFSA form. Okay. So the question is, so three months after that, you have to put a new roof on your, on your house or you buy a new car. So if you're putting the new roof on your house because there was some sort of natural disaster, then you would contact the school because it's a special circumstance. But the, the fact that you're putting in, if you're just putting a new roof on your house because it's time, or you're buying a new car because it's time, that's factored into the financial aid formula based on, there's a, um, what is it called? I can't think of what the, what the portion of it is called in the, in the expected family contribution calculation, but based on your family size and the number in college, there is an amount that is set aside for daily living expenses. It is not based on um, your, the way that you live, it is the same and it's based on the number in the family and the number in college, okay? But it's not on individual preferences for purchasing items. We, most schools will not look at credit card debt. 
as a, something that is allowed against that expected family contribution or for an appeal. Um, so that's just everyday normal living. Yeah. So if your income is beyond, be underneath the poverty line, then you will have an automatic zero expected family contribution. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. Your expected family contribution will automatically be zero because there are thresholds in the formula. More questions? If you don't agree with the expected family contribution, can you talk about the appeal process? You can certainly contact the school, and um, if you've got circumstances to appeal, like someone has lost their job, there's been a death, someone is underemployed in 2016, they're working, but they're not working as much, there's been a natural disaster, um, there has to be some circumstance that has changed since you filled out that financial aid application for the schools to calculate a new expected family contribution, and you would have to submit documentation to support that change. Yeah? From history, I think the better way to answer the question is, if you get a financial package from a college, and an older son had two colleges he was competing with, don't accept the financial package as a, as a done deal. Call the college up, ask for more money, you may get surprised and get grants and scholarships you weren't even aware of. Perhaps. So if you've got two schools, and that school perhaps really wants that student to attend, perhaps they will increase the grant package. And that you're probably talking about a private school. You're not talking about public schools. You're talking perhaps at a private school that has um, the ability to increase the financial aid package um, and perhaps increase the institutional loan. Um, it really depends on the school. Some schools will negotiate that financial aid award and other schools will not. At UMass Amherst, the first offer is the best offer. We don't fold money back. Um, and it really depends on perhaps the academic strength of the student who's asking for more financial aid as well. More questions? What if um, at, after graduation, you talked about the six months before you have to start repaying back the loan? Can you renegotiate this? If the amount they have expected is too high? Or? There are all kinds of um, um, different repayment plans to for students once they graduate from, from high school or from college to pay back their loans. So studentloans.gov is a great website to go out and look at all the, the different repayment options. There is an income contingent option for repaying student loans. Um, so look at the different options that are available for repaying the loans on studentloans.gov. Okay. More questions? Well, thank you all for inviting me here tonight. If you've got individual questions that you would like to ask me after, I'll certainly be available for them.